Good morning, everyone. Good morning and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to our service of worship here on Palm Sunday, an especially important Sunday in the life of the Christian year. Um, on Palm Sunday, of course, we're going to uh, be shouting Hosanna. We have Palm Sunday Palooza happening outside with our, uh, our guest donkeys, Sterling and Sherlock, and donuts and coffee, and hope you'll stop by for a few minutes after the service is over. It's a, it's a great, great time. But it is an interesting Sunday, right? We do start by shouting Hosanna, and by the end of the service, we are pointing toward the cross. And so uh, a lot takes place in this next hour, and a lot's taking place throughout the coming week. Uh, not only do we kick off Holy Week with Palm Sunday, but throughout the week we have some really special and important services. Um, starting tomorrow, we're, we're having a, a lunch for widows and widowers. It's called Healing Connection. It's going to meet at uh, Johnny Luke's Restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants. Uh, tomorrow you can see that in the bulletin. Um, so if, um, if you'd like to join up with that group, uh, then uh, make sure to be there tomorrow. Uh, Thursday is our Maundy Thursday service where we remember Jesus' last supper with his disciples. We'll be right back here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock on Thursday for that ever-important special service. Friday is Good Friday. That's the day that we remember that Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins. And so we'll be meeting actually over at Oleander, Wrightsville on Oleander, where we'll have a self-guided prayer walk that takes place from 8 to 4. You can just come anytime between 8 and 4 on Friday to uh, remember the importance of Good Friday. I hope you'll put that on your calendar and make plans to come and be a part of that as well. Next Sunday, of course, is the biggest Sunday of the year. It's Easter Sunday. We're going to start out at the beach. At, uh, our Easter sunrise service is at the end of Oxford Street. It begins at 6.30 in the morning. And so I hope to see you there. And then we'll be here, uh, as always, at 8.15, 9.45, and 11.15. Uh, parking's always a little tricky on Easter. You know that. So you want to come early, but also make plans to use the trolley. You can park over at Wrightsville Beach Elementary School, and, um, and you can take the trolley with your family over here. Always a lot of fun to do that each and every year. So you uh, can make plans to participate in... Uh, uh, the special Easter services that way. Um, and I will tell you, you know, this is the most crowded service on Easter, um, is the 945. So if you wanted to come to one of the other services, um, it might be a little bit easier to find parking at one of those. Um, just a little heads up. And then after Easter is over, you have the opportunity to be in service. We're going to be um, cooking meals for homeless families right here in Wilmington between April 7th and April 13th. The name of the ministry is called Family Promise. And you can sign up to uh, prepare a meal right here on the bulletin board out here in the hallway. And so, uh, you know, if, if you feel like, you know, that's something I'd really like to do. I, I want to help out somebody that's in need um, during this Easter uh, time. Uh, then make sure you uh, stop by the bulletin board outside. Well, that's all the announcements that I have. So why don't we take a big, deep breath and worship the Lord our God.
Thank you to our choirs and to our children as they lead us in worship today. Let us join together in prayer. You'll find our congregational prayer written in your bulletin. Merciful God, search us and know us in this season of Lent. Grant us courage to take honest stock of ourselves and acknowledge our wrongdoing. Jesus, as we walk with you towards the cross, take away our bent to sinning and teach us how to live. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is actually found in an insert in your bulletin. It's all glory, laud, and honor. Let's stand and sing it together.
please turn to your neighbor and greet them in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm told by the ushers we need just a few more spots for folks that are looking for a seat, um, especially for some of the parents that help the kids. Um, so if, uh, if you've got a seat uh, near you, if you could raise your hand, uh, that would be great. Also, if um, maybe we could move toward the walls, wherever you are, just move toward the walls and give space on the ends for people to be able to find a seat. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm Eunsoo Kang, one of the associate pastors here. It is my great honor to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, thank you for giving us this holy day to come before you. Thank you for calling us to this holy place to worship you. This is the day that you have made. Help us rejoice and be glad in it. We stand for the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection. Thank you for sending your son and paving the way for our lives to be set free through Jesus Christ. Only your ways are righteous and true. Only your love stands firm forever. But we often forget this truth. We would rather sing hosannas with a cheering crowd than stand up for our convictions in the face of an angry mob. We would rather dine with Christ at his table than stand up for him in a courtyard of accusers. We would rather see ourselves as Christ's champions then admit to ourselves that we too could betray him. Forgive our fickle faith and heal our heart. Merciful God, help us sit silently and feel the depth of your love. Our Holy Week is in your hands. Guide us on this journey that we may be ever faithful, ever hopeful, and ever loving. Lord, we seek your grace and comfort. We ask your peace for those enduring difficult seasons. Now, we lift up in prayer those who are in need of your merciful touch. So we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your strength and comfort upon them. Touch their lives and souls with your warm embrace. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gifts. As we respond to God's generosity and God's grace, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church by placing your offering on the plate or using QR code in the insert. Now, I want to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our offerings and tithes. <clears throat>
It is time for a children's message. If there are any kids, welcome to comfort and join me this time. So excited to share this time with y'all. So today is a special Sunday, and do you know what today is called? Palm Sunday. Yes, Palm Sunday. Yeah, today is Palm Sunday. So today we're going to talk about the meaning of Palm Sunday. So about 2,000 years ago, Jesus and his disciples were traveling to the city of Jerusalem, and the city was going to have a big celebration. So Jesus needed something right to enter the city. A donkey. Yes, right. So his disciples brought a donkey. Have you ever seen a donkey or two special guests? Yes, yeah, that donkey. So his disciples brought a donkey and um, they put their clothes on its back so that Jesus could have a comfy seat. Um, and when uh, they entered the town, the people who were there had already heard about Jesus, the healing the sick, delivering good news, and also doing amazing things like miracles. So a big crowd gathered there to see Jesus, and they threw their clothes on the road to make a better way. And also, um, they waved palm branches trees, as we saw at the beginning of this um, the worship service, to welcome Jesus. And they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means, save us, save us, Lord, save us now. So it is a big like crowd and big celebration and big a parade as we saw at the beginning of worship service. But the people didn't really understand who Jesus was. They thought he would be a king and do something for them, providing a good food and making them rich and um, just um, making them for having more of good fame. So in um, just a few days later, the same people who had welcomed Jesus changed their mind and they shouted, crucify him. Um, so from today and for this week, we are remembering a journey, Jesus' journey from welcome to suffering and to the death. But here is the good news. Next Sunday we have Easter, Easter. yes, which means Jesus would rise again. So today, when we praise and when we shout Hosanna, let us remember, save us, Jesus, save us. You are the Lord and you are my Savior, okay? Okay, okay. let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Help us remember your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You can go back to your seat. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy and privilege to get to bring you our scripture passage and message today. You can find our scripture in this light purple insert that's in your bulletin, um, as well as a place where you can scribble, write notes, write thoughts to yourself, all of that. So our reading today comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. Hear now this word. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, 
Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, anything that I say that isn't from you, please let it be instantly forgotten. But God, if there's anything I say that is from you, let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I will never forget the magic of reading Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet for the first time. I was a freshman in high school, and I thought that my English teacher was the coolest woman on the planet, probably because she was. Seriously, my best friend and I used to spend our sleepovers trying to recreate Miss Mill's signature look, shimmery lavender eyeshadow. It never worked on us. She had a million ways to make the stories that we read come alive. But the one that sticks with me most is this. After we finished reading Romeo and Juliet, she told us to go back through and try to find the moment when it all went wrong. Where was the point of no return? When was it that the die was cast and that the fates of these two young lovers were sealed? I remember sitting in one of those slippery metal chair desk combinations, you know the ones I'm talking about, and combing back through the play trying to find this moment. Was it when Romeo arrived at the crypt too soon? Was it when Friar Lawrence's message didn't make it? Was it the death of Mercutio and Tybalt? None of these moments seemed quite right. I kept turning the pages backwards, backwards, going earlier and earlier into the story, until finally I came to the conclusion that the moment their fate was sealed was the moment when Romeo and Juliet locked eyes at the ball. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, character is destiny. It is who we are that determines our fate. And in the best tragedies, it's the very fatal flaws of the characters that bring about their downfall instead of circumstances. I found this idea fascinating. And ever since that first reading of Romeo and Juliet, I have loved tragic plays, books, and movies. Perhaps that's why I find the story that we read today, the story of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, to be so compelling. Jesus' death, too, is a tragedy. If the gospel was a play, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem would be the first scene of the final act. Imagine, if you will, our stage. The curtains open, and entering from stage right is Jesus, riding in on a stallion. Nope, that's not right. Riding in on a donkey. Have you seen a donkey recently? Some of you have, right? And if you haven't, I would invite you to go and meet our two special guests, Sterling and Sherlock, after the service. You will notice that they are not very big. In fact, I'm pretty short, but I almost wonder if I tried to ride one of those donkeys, if my feet might actually graze the ground a little bit. That is a very strange mode of transportation for a full-grown man especially one who's being welcomed as a king. And that's exactly what this crowd is doing. 
lining the streets, cheering, waving palm branches. This probably wouldn't be the first time that they had done this. You see, the Romans called this a triumph. When Caesar had won some great military victory, he would ride into town on a giant war horse or on a chariot. And along with him would be this procession of people carrying all of the spoils of war, the treasures that they took from the conquered people and even captured slaves. Everyone would line the streets and shout and cheer and wave palm branches. So when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, the people are treating him like a king who's won a major victory. And Jesus is riding in on a donkey and not a horse because he isn't the same type of king that Caesar is. He isn't about military might and political power. He's signaling his humility, but at the same time, he's also pointing to his true identity because Jesus is actually something much greater than Caesar. Jesus is the long-awaited King of Israel, the Messiah. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, he's embodying a well-known prophecy about the Messiah that came from the prophet Zechariah. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, if this were a play, this might be the moment when you think that against all odds, it's going to be OK anyway, right? The people are cheering. They recognize Jesus as the king of Israel. But in the background, the religious leaders and the government officials, they're not smiling. And as readers who know this story already, we can see the irony. That this same crowd that is crying Hosanna on Sunday, by Friday, will be yelling, crucify him. So when does it all go wrong? Where is that point of no return? Who is it that's to blame? I often find myself reading the Gospels and thinking that if I had been there, things would have been different. That's what's so fun about a tragedy, isn't it? We can put ourselves in the story and imagine that if we had been there, we could have made a different choice. We could have kept that next domino from falling down. When the crowds yell, crucify him, I make believe that I would stand up and defend Jesus. When Judas agrees to betray Jesus for 30 silver coins, I think about how I would have told the Pharisees to get lost. When Peter claims that he never even met Jesus, I picture myself refusing to leave Jesus' side, confidently proclaiming my allegiance. But in my heart of hearts, I know that I wouldn't have done any better. Character is destiny. Maybe, like in Romeo and Juliet, the moment that it all goes wrong is actually much further back than we thought. Perhaps Jesus' death was determined not in the final week of his life, in the Garden of Gethsemane, but instead in the Garden of Eden. We've spent the season of Lent getting really honest about how we have strayed from what God wants for us. We were created to be in relationship with God, but instead we decided that we would rather try to be God ourselves. God gave us a beautiful world and told us to take care of the earth, but instead we abused the earth for our own profits. God gave us the gift of meaningful work, but instead of receiving it as a gift, we turned it into an idol. God created us to be in loving relationship with one another, 
but instead of treating each other as equals, we started using each other as tools. These are universal problems, and they run deep. At their core, all of these distortions have one common thread. It's the whisper of the serpent in the garden saying, do you really believe you can trust God? Did God really say that? Maybe you're remembering it wrong. Do you think maybe God's just holding out on you? This is the toxic idea that the serpent has put in our heads. You cannot trust God. And one way or another, it is this lie that leads to Jesus' execution. The Pharisees and the other religious leaders have become obsessed with certainty. They and they alone have all the answers about what's wrong and what's right. They alone know what is biblical. They've traded honest dependence on God for their own certainty. And so they couldn't recognize Jesus because he didn't fit into their paradigm of Messiah. And when they see someone who's threatening their religious power, they take matters into their own hands and they plot to kill Jesus. The Roman government officials never had any interest whatsoever in trusting God. After all, what's the point of trusting in God when you can get whatever you want if you have a strong enough military? But even the Roman religion itself wasn't built on trust or relationship with God, but instead on making sacrifices to the right gods at the right moments to get whatever it is that you wanted. But for Jesus, Peter, and the other disciples, their lack of trust in God feels so much more heartbreaking. Even after three years of walking with Jesus, Judas still chooses to betray him for the equivalent of a few thousand dollars. Now, we don't know what his motivation was. Maybe it was purely for the money. Or maybe he had some sort of ideological dispute with Jesus. We don't know. But the other disciples, they weren't much better. As soon as Jesus is arrested, the other disciples scatter. Maybe they no longer believed that God was on Jesus' side. If God was with Jesus, then how could he be arrested at all? Or maybe it's that they no longer trusted God to take care of them, and so they decided to protect themselves. You can't trust God. A lie so potent that it changed the course of all our lives. A lie that leads to the greatest tragedy imaginable. When the Son of God was killed by the very ones that he came to save. Jesus' death is a tragedy. And it's tragic all the more because we are still a part of it today. I know that if I had been the one in the garden, I would have taken that fruit too. And if I had been in that crowd in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, it would have been my voice crying out, crucify, crucify. When we face the tragedy head on, we see that although we have always had free will, the story was never going to go another way because character is destiny. And our character has been changed by the serpent's lie. If we were the ones holding the pen, this would be it. Our ultimate rejection of God would be the moment when the curtains close. But God was writing a bigger story. We might have thought that this was our story, but it has been God's from the very 
beginning. And God was telling a story that says that there is nothing that will keep God's love from getting to us. That God can use even our rebellion to set us free. That God can use our very lack of faith to confirm God's promises. Yes, character is destiny. But praise God, because our character doesn't have the final say. Jesus's character is our destiny. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you that when our love failed and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. Jesus, give us courage this week to face the reality of the cross and give us still hope that our destiny is determined not by our failings, but by your love. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you now to stand and join together in our opening hymn, number 289, Ah, Holy Jesus.
please be seated for our closing anthem. During Lent, um, we've been giving you some sort of action to take in the following week to put the message into action. And this week, 
your challenge is perhaps simple, but can also be very difficult. Um, and that is to resist the temptation to skip to Easter. Find time during this Holy Week to remember Jesus' work on the cross. We'd love to come alongside you in that. There's several um, offerings that we have here at Wrightsville that you've already heard about. We have a Maundy Thursday service here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock on Thursday. We'll also have a self-guided prayer time at Wrightsville on Oleander on Friday from 8 in the morning to 4 o'clock. Anytime you want to stop by, you can. We also will have on Friday digital um, Stations of the Cross that you can use. And if none of those options are going to work for you, I would ask you to spend some time in prayer and scripture reading on your own to mark this holy, holy time. I invite you now to stand for our benediction. As you go now from this place, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.